Heavenly Father, you have spoken to us in your word. Uh, Lord, as we listen to what you're saying to us, we pray that we would understand what you're saying, we would believe what you're saying. Uh, would you work in our hearts so we can, um, you could, we would be the people you want us to be uh, as we put our trust in the Son, the King you've given us, Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. Well, there's an old story uh, from Madrid in Spain. Uh, it was from when the name Paco was the most uh, common name for boys. Uh, someone had put an advertisement uh, in the local paper which said, Paco, meet me at Hotel Montana noon Tuesday. All is forgiven, Papa. Well, the story goes they needed a squadron of the Civil Guard to be called out to disperse the 800 young men who answered the advertisement. Well, of course, it's an urban myth, uh, but it makes the point, doesn't it, that 800 young men all seeking the forgiveness of their papa. We humans have a desperate need for forgiveness. Do you ever find, like I do, wandering around in your thoughts and you bump into a painful memory and you wince those words that you said that you can never take back? You can't undo that damage. You can say sorry and you can mean it, but the forgiveness has to come from the other side, doesn't it? And hopefully it did for you. And you think of how much that forgiveness costs that person. There's a kind of a sadness mixed with joy as you think about those kind of memories, isn't there? There's plenty of those for me. Or maybe sometimes you've only got the first part of that memory, that painful memory, the part where you did the damage, but you've yet to receive the forgiveness. So perhaps you're asking tonight or just in your deeper thoughts, your times of reflection, how can I get them to forgive me? But you know deep down the forgiveness isn't something you can extract from another person, is it? If they're not willing to forgive, then you remain unforgiven. Of course, there's ways to cope with that if they they don't forgive. But what you really crave is those three words, I forgive you. But tonight we're going to have briefly have a look at a a little song written um, and sung uh, during a lesser uh, well-known event from the Bible. It's the birth of John, who has come, come to known as, be known as John the Baptist. It happened a few months just before the first Christmas. Now, friends, you might be someone who has not received the forgiveness you so desperately need from your friends or maybe your family. Well, this little song is a message to you from your Creator. It tells you that things are far better than you could hope for. On the other hand, maybe you've never thought that much about what you've needed to be forgiven for. Maybe you're asking, well, what's in my life that I desperately need forgiveness for? My life's been fine. Not perfect, but okay. I don't really need forgiveness, thanks. Well, friends, if you're that person, someone who doesn't especially need forgiveness, well, this little, mess, this little song is a message from your creator to you as well. It tells you that things are far worse than you might uh, be willing to admit. But before I, we take a look at the song, I'll just quickly tell you how it came about. Here's the story. It comes from a little book uh, called Luke, written by a doctor, uh, and he tracked down all those who were closest to Jesus, or people who had been uh, at, at the most important moments in Jesus' life, and he interviews them. Now, this little account begins with an ageing couple who can't have children. There's a husband, Zechariah, he's a Jewish priest, and his wife, Elizabeth, who is actually a close relative of Mary, the one who's going to be Jesus' mum. Now, one day, Zechariah is in the temple and he's performing this ceremony. It's a yearly thing. And suddenly, this angel appears to him. He's terrified. And the angel says, Zechariah, God's heard your prayer. You and your wife will have a baby. A baby boy. Well, not just any baby. He's going to fulfill an ancient prophecy about one who would appear just before the Lord God himself comes to his people. Now, you're to name this baby John, and his job is to prepare God's people for the visit of their God. Well, Zechariah responds, Really? 
I mean, do you know how old I and my wife are? Well, the angel Gabriel says, God himself told me this good news to give to you. That because you don't believe him, you're not going to be able to speak until the baby is born. Well, of course, Elizabeth gets pregnant and she has a baby and everyone's thrilled uh, when he's born. Now, it comes to the time of naming the baby. And because uh, Zechariah can't speak, uh, all the other relatives uh, assume that they would name him after his father. But then his mum pipes up and says, no, 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 no. No, his name is John. They say, John? You don't have any relatives called John. And so they, uh, so Zechariah asks for a writing tablet and he writes very clearly, his name is John. And you can guess what happens then. He speaks again. And when he does, he praises God. Now, uh, the whole town is freaked out. And uh, it's a small town, so word gets around pretty quickly. But they're not talking about Zechariah. They're talking about the baby. What is this baby going to be? Well, that moment uh, Zechariah first speaks, God puts a song into his heart. And it goes like this. Well, just before I read it. As I said before, this little song is a message to you from your creator. Creator. It may tell you that things are far better than you imagine or far worse than you're prepared to admit. And here's how it goes, but without the tune. Uh, We're going to be reading from uh, Luke chapter 1, from verses 57 to down to 80. Uh, That's on page 908. So um, please read along with me. So from Luke... Chapter 1, verses 60 from 67. Then his father, that's John's father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. Here's what he said. Blessed is the Lord, the God of Israel, because he's visited and provided redemption for his people. He's raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, just as he spoke by the mouth of his, anci- of his holy prophets in ancient times salvation from our enemies and from the hand of those who hate us. He's dealt mercifully with our fathers and remembered his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham. He's given us the privilege, since we've been rescued from the hand of our enemies, to serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness, in his presence all our days. And you, child, you will be called the prophet of the Most High, For you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give his people knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Because of our God's merciful compassion, the dawn from on high will visit us to shine on those who live in darkness and the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. And then Luke concludes his section with, And the child grew up, became spiritually strong and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. Well, there's a lot in that song that may not make any sense if you don't know the backstory of Israel's history. I'm not going to give that now, but I'm just going to try and sum up what Zechariah is saying. He's saying, God has kept his ancient promise to our forefather Abraham that he save his people. The Saviour will come from the family of King David And then we'll be free to worship our God without fear. And you, John, my boy, have been chosen to become come just before God visits his people to tell us how he's going to save us. Here's the summary. God will save his people. But what are God's people need saving from? I'm just going to pick out one line from his song that answers that question. Zechariah says, For you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give his people knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. See, God's people need to be saved from their sins. That's their biggest problem, right from the start. And the Bible tells us it's not just God's people, the Israelites, who have the problem. It's the whole planet, me, you. Sin. You see, it's not just some really bad thing we do here or there. It affects our whole lives. 
We all have lives that say, you're not the boss of me, God. I'll live my own way. Uh, Thanks very much. See, sin is like a sickness. Its symptoms are our lies, our gossip and our wandering eyes and our greed, etc., etc., etc. But the problem is deep in our hearts. We don't want God to be God over our lives. God himself has said there's only one cure for this sickness we call sin. See, what did Zechariah say? Is that cure? Salvation through the forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness. Forgiveness from God. Forgiveness for our rebellion against God and a rebellion we express in so many different ways every day. Now, you might be someone who doesn't feel the need for forgiveness. My life's okay. You may not think you've needed particular forgiveness from your family or from your friends. Well, do they see it that way? I don't know. But friends, I don't know who you are, but you've been rebelling against God. And his assessment of your life is not fine. It's rebel, sinner. So you can see why I said this message from God shows you that things are far worse than you might imagine. You have a sickness, and it's called sin. And there's a cure. There's only one cure. And it may not be that easy to swallow. It's God's forgiveness. That's the cure. But you might be someone who knows that they need forgiveness from family or from friends. And maybe as far as you know, you've never received it. Now, I hope you were listening to what Zechariah was singing and therefore what God was saying to the previous group, ones who don't feel they need forgiveness, whoever they might be. Yes, you in the second group may need forgiveness from your family or friends, but the forgiveness you need from your God is far more desperate. You've been rebelling against your creator, the God of the universe. So you've got this sickness too, like me. And there's only one cure, but it is a cure that is freely available. And the cure is not try harder. Just try harder not to be sick. See, God's told you you're already sick. The one cure he has for you is his forgiveness. You don't have to earn it. You just have to know that you need it and accept it. As I said, this event that we've been talking about, the birth of of John, happens just a few months before Jesus' birth. And that birth is God visiting his people. The birth is the eternal God becoming human. Now, it's been a pretty rocky relationship between God and humans up to that point. Mankind has expressed for generation after generation, get lost, God. We'll be our own gods, thanks. Now, you think when God arrives, it'll be time for a jolly good scolding, wouldn't you? Well, that's what I'd do if I were God. A day of reckoning. But thankfully, God's not like me or you. God does visit his world. God becomes a human. He's that little baby, little baby laid in a feeding trough, pushed out by his mum and then popped in some hay. And he comes not to scold as much as we deserve it, but to forgive. He becomes a human to do the thing that that makes the forgiveness possible. What Bernard was talking about in the kids' talk, that's the story of Easter. And this forgiveness comes at a great cost to him. But he gives it freely and gladly to any rebel, to any sinner who knows that they need it. I'm going to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that at great cost to yourself you have bought our forgiveness for us. We do thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.